Bonjour à tous, j'imagine que Good morning everyone. I think that that's the end of the jingle so maybe we can get started with this uh, beautiful session that we've got this morning. Half past nine to 11 o'clock we'll be speaking about very serious things. It's not all fun and games but maybe a little bit. I think they'll be very passionate. Thank you very much to, for being here with us in the room. I'm delighted to see you all. We can see that there are people, a couple of people by the door but don't be scared to come in front and we've also got those watching online as well. Thank you very much to those who have joined in online. It's great to have what, such a wonderful conference and we are going to be talking about Blue Finance and you will understand what we're talking about and how can we make impact finance an ally of the oceans and the seabed. We've got a lot on the table for this morning. My name is Quentin Baumier. I'm a journalist and by trade and I will wait a little bit so that you can understand. Um, I am the co-founder of René Brand, which is a prod, um, an audiovisual and environmental prod agency. We look at the environment with different means. We've got multimedia, such as podcasts and also videos. And we've also got René Prod, which is really, really into the sea and the oceans. I would like to thank Convergence for having invited me to be part of this session uh, on Blue Finance. Blue Finance. I don't know about you, but when I hear um, blue, blue is something positive, right? Uh, maybe a couple of expressions that aren't so positive. For example, a cordon bleu. Everyone knows what a cordon bleu is. For children, uh, um, love making cordon bleu as well. I think about the grand bleu. Beautiful. And my si my daughter actually told me this yesterday. What about ce rêve bleu? A whole new world, very Disney but also very beautiful. We, uh, I would like to say that Blue Finance is a mix of all of these things, these three things. So we're looking at uh, filling your belly. We're also thinking about the unknown and the depths of the unknown, but then a little bit of fairy tale. Blue, because we're talking about the ocean. When we talk about the ocean, let's not bury our heads in the sand. It, things aren't going very well. The, we've got rising sea levels. We've got the rising temperatures in the oceans, we've got lots of marine ecosystems that are threatened, and for this we need to get things rolling. Finance, why? Because we'll be talking about the means to finance different purchase projects that will allow us to protect our oceans. And this is very important for everyone. This is going to be at the heart of what we'll be talking about this morning. When we talk about projects as well, we also mean projects with three, four, five syllables. Decarbonization, regeneration of our oceans, really interesting. What else? Biotechnology, um, sustainable, ecotourism. And how can we get to the end of these projects? We need financing. We've got more and more finances and funders now looking to cover this theme, which once again will help us to conserve the environment, the plants in the ocean. So. There you go, my definition of blue finance, and maybe that will differ slightly um, from that of my different speakers, but you have a wild card. Let me just introduce my different speakers who will be taking the floor one after the other. I will also be here just to ask any questions, and also you will be able to take the opportunity to ask questions that you may have to our speakers. Sabine gesselon bouquet Sabine is Director of Investments at Massif. Massif uh, is an insurance company looking to insure, insure or conserve the ocean. Uh, Sabine will be coming back to you in a little bit. And we've also got Christian Lim. How are you doing, Christian? Yeah, I'm great, thank you. You are the Managing Director for Swan Blue Ocean. This is a capital fund for innovation in regeneration of our oceans. And Christian will be going, will be diving into his universe data. Uh, no pun intended, because I think that you're also a diver. Is that right? Yes, and you are a free diver as well. Yes, when you have to hold your breath. And we've also got Jérôme Bellin, who is the CEO and founder of Removal uh, Carbon. You are specialized in development and investment for carbon sequestration and also protection of ecosystems. Uh, we will be coming back to you later, Jérôme, because it's fascinating. We've also got Anaïs Deprez, who is a 
responsible for mobilization for the Platform for Asian Climat, the Platform for Oceans and Climate, therefore, and we'll be talking a little bit about what this platform does. This is a, a coalition of actors linked to the ocean. We were talking about researchers, uh, institutes, centers, foundations, private sector is also present on this platform. And all of this to showcase the ocean, both from a policy point of view, but also from the greater public. And Ais, if you allow me to do so, I'd like you to maybe, to, I want you to be the spokesperson of the ocean. And maybe we can also look a little bit more at the details, the facts that are important, the scientific aspects so that we're able to ensure that the debate is as fluid as possible. I will do my best. First question is for you, and Anais, it goes without saying. You'll see that it's a very vague question, but I think it's important to really set the scene prior to diving in. Um, how's the ocean doing at the moment? Not very well, but the ocean is the biggest uh, biodiversity reservoir on uh, the planet. We're talking about two thirds. So even if it's not going very well, uh, lots of things are happening, lots of beautiful things are happening in the ocean, especially the platform Océan Climat. We're looking at broadcasting and sharing what the role of the ocean is. We're talking about biodiversity, the climate, but also us as human society. If you allow me to do so, therefore, then I, let me put things into context. Uh, so that you understand what the role of the ocean is. The ocean is 71% uh, of the terrestrial surface of the planet. It is the biggest um, reservoir of biodiversity on Earth. It's completely crazy. And the number of species that we haven't even discovered yet in the ocean, uh, including the biggest uh, species, the whale, and also the smallest being the microplankton. We work on the fact that the ocean is the biggest climate regulator on Earth. This is something that is not very well known. 93% of, of heat generated from human activity is absorbed by the ocean. Therefore, without the ocean, we wouldn't be able to live on the planet. It would just be carbonized. What does the ocean do? It absorbs um, heat and redistributes this across the four corners of the world. This is very important, especially when we're trying to fight against climate change. The ocean is also, with the forest, the biggest um, carbon absorber. Uh, you understand the process, it's a physical process. When carbon comes into contact with the water, carbon dioxide dissolves, and then you've got the different marine currents that transport carbon dioxide um, to the, uh, the seabed. And we also have biology or biological rather aspects that Jerome will be able to speak to you better than mine. We've got phytoplankton, uh, photosynthesis that works with oxygen. There are also lots of different oxygen ecosystems looking at blue carbon and absorbing carbon dioxide. The ocean helps us to mitigate the impacts of climate change. We speak a lot about forests, but the ocean also has a role to play. The ocean also produces 50% of the oxygen available on Earth. It is also a source of food, which is fundamental for more than 3 billion individuals on the Earth. So there you go, it's very important for humans and it's also a source of employment. Uh, if we looked at GDP, it would have been the seventh biggest GDP. I know it's a very sensitive topic. We're sensitive to the ocean because it is well-being. Uh, I personally went to the Mediterranean coast this summer. It's incredible to see all of these human beings that are so happy to be uh, on the beach and in contact with water. It's also important for lots of different cultures. We know the ocean, the ocean rather, is the is, is important for um, Eurasian cultures especially. We've got this at different levels of our life, but also for us as humans, uh, we are the ones that are threatening the ocean. Yes, we are indeed. The IPCC report speaks about human activity and the impact on the ocean. We've got a combined impact, and this also is very important for uh, marine ecosystems. As I was mentioning, the first, the biggest threat is greenhouse gas emissions. This will have the biggest impact on the ocean. Why? Because greenhouse gas emissions create uh, warming. Warming in on the planet or on Earth creates warming in the pla in the sea. And unfortunately, because of the speed of these changes, the different species that are found in the ocean are unable unable to adapt. This means that uh, coral reefs, for example, that can't move, they can't migrate, are threatened. 
and they play an important role for adaptation to climate change. <coughs> Another phenomena that we have in the atmosphere is acidification of the sea. The more CO2 is carbon dioxide, rather there is, the higher the acid levels in the sea, thus modifying the pH level. And this, these important changes or significant changes prevent the good development of different species that need structures uh, from limestone. Therefore, this has an impact on an economic activity. We have two other major impacts, the deoxygenation. For example, the fact that oxygen is not well produced or not as well produced in warmer waters. And we keep hearing about rising sea levels. Why? Because hot water dilates, takes up more space. It's, uh, think about when you boil water in a saucepan, there's higher volume. And because we also have the melting of ice caps, which is adding to the level and the number of, or level of water, volume of water available in the oceans, thus threatening the human species. We also have overfishing, uh, artificialization of coastlines, and if we want to, often when we're trying to um, look at urban development on coast science, we're destroying ecosystems. We've got exploitation of fishing, and that is the main threat. But unfortunately, the uh, ocean has a lot to deal with, and it's easier said than done. Uh, we seem to think that it is infinite and it will always be there, but actually the functions have been alt um, altered by climate change and it's very difficult for us to really have an idea of how long the ocean will be able to cope with rising sea levels and rising temperatures and all of the other elements that impact uh, the ocean. So we're not very optimistic if we continue like this, is that right? I don't know if you speak about this at the Plateforme Ocean and Climat, but just to finish this off, what are we doing for the ocean? What are you doing for the ocean? It's very difficult for us to measure this science uh, and ocean related oceanic science is maybe quite new. We've got the first uh, expeditions that were launched 50 years ago and there are lots of things that we don't know because it is an environment that is quite inaccessible. If we think about 11,000 meters of depth for some of these seabeds and we need to have technical uh, capacities to allow us to access the seabed in certain areas, which is not currently the case, we need to be able to anticipate. However, what is certain is that the IPCC is looking at this and has been looking at this, speaking in their reports about this. The different changes that the ocean is undergoing are unseen, and we've never seen these before for millions, of, for thousands rather of years. Therefore, state of play is not very positive, but there is light at the end of the tunnel. There are ecosystems that are showing a lot of resilience, and we are discovering coral species that are able to adapt better than others. Therefore, we're better up understanding the dynamics. There are species that are able to migrate, to adapt, uh, to adapt rather at crazy speeds. I'm not sure if you've heard about the story of polar bears that are starting to go brown, so that they're able to deal with the fact that you have ice caps that are melting. And within all of this. I don't think all living beings will be able to adapt at this speed. And the fact that we're going to say goodbye to some of founding and important species is a shame. You spoke about optimism. Sabine uh, Kessenon um, can we be optimistic about the ocean? Uh, do you, is La Massif uh, optimistic with regards to what you're doing in order to conserve the ocean? I think we have to be optimistic in order to get involved and take action. I think we're all trying to do something in our own way, to raise awareness uh, to our uh, shareholders, to work alongside with them, to invest. Also, we will talk about this Massif and the Ocean is a real long story, an old story, actually. Since 1972, we started to insure uh, ship owners, and we have a scheme to support uh, ship owners. Um, as you know, Massif as an insurance company and yachtsmen are working hand in hand. Uh, we've been supporting all the uh, races. So indeed, it's, it's an old story. It's a long story. What has been the link, practically speaking, what is your actual 
position? What do you do at Massif and in which way does this have anything to do with the ocean? Um, in charge of investments, investments are either people that uh, are uh, giving us their savings for, for savings for preparing their retirement or insurance companies for uh, for housing so we get we place money uh, and we deal with any kind of um, disaster so we have a role to secure and to uh, get some uh, turnover on the savings we try to have a positive impact not just financially we don't just deal with risks and investment but also with the ESG the climate, ocean, biodiversity is also part of the environment. S is, of course, is social and societal and governance, of course, is uh, the way that companies are managed. So we try to take into account those three criteria in our investments, and we are convinced that this may have some positive impact in order to reduce risks as part of a portfolio management. And the ocean now, the Massif as a company and your investments really are, you have your feet in the water. Do you have an example maybe of a recent investment in order to preserve the ocean? Christian can talk about this. At Massif, uh, we were one of the sponsors, one of the support in a, the creation of a Blue Ocean Fund, uh, investing for the ocean. Yes, behind, it's not actually the right slide behind us, but no no worries. Yes, let's look at the main slide. Thank you. Very beautiful. Okay, so there's the example of Swen, but the rest of our portfolio, we have a diverse portfolio, and we've tried to work on this topic. Not all companies have a connection with the ocean. Okay, let's look into this portfolio. What do you have in your portfolio then? On the topic of ocean, we want to have a dialogue with companies. We are convinced that you have to talk with companies rather than exclude them. We have a few exclusions like fossil energy, like coal, etc. But that's not the main part. What is important to us is a dialogue, and we have decided to talk about fight against plastic regarding ocean. So we have selected companies which have the most uh, challenges, could be textile, could be automotive sector. Just to give you a few, we have identified about 20 companies, and we have uh, we have a catalog, uh, we have a questionnaire as well to ask them to give, share their scientific expertise or experience. So Friday is an NGO which we have been supporting for some time now and has great connections with the ocean, especially on the issue of mapping plastics, the origin of plastics. And we also have in other topic on maritime transport and the pollution that it uh, entails. So we do have a partnership with them. And in our insurance contracts, we have the possibility for our contributors to uh, be involved in this NGO. Uh, so through this connection, we have developed a questionnaire which we sent to all these companies. What kind of questions were in this questionnaire? So what we are looking for are the best practices. What are the companies doing to fight against plastic pollution? So it's a kind of an inventory, is it, of best practices? Yes, that indeed, in order to go in the right direction. Yes, we want to put forward uh, the best practices and really display the best practices. I could tell you a bit more about that. Uh, contrary to what Christian will be sharing, we are talking here about big companies, large companies. Swen and I, we finance smaller companies, but here we're talking about larger ones. We have identified some best practices. Just to give you an example, a larger, yes, could we have names? We want names, we want names. Okay, Unilever, so the, we're talking about huge company. They have a number of indicators to have, for for example, by 25, 100% of their products being recyclable. 
are reusable and about 25 percent of plastic recycled to collect more plastic than the produced plastic these are the kind of indicators and goals which are going in the right direction so they took it all the way unilever leadership um, as part of their um, income have the uh, goal of this or the achievement of this goal so they took it all the way to the achievement of the goal. So if I was to reach my goals, my sustainable goals, so I would get money. Is that right? Is that a way to say it? Yes, pretty much. And does this work? Yes. Is this a good practice? Yes. We're convinced that this is part of the things that can motivate people, that all the collaborators can be motivated and mobilized to reach that goal. So we're talking about goals here. Practically speaking, do you have a vision of what is really happening on the ground? Yeah, we could all say let's just decrease our plastic production by 50% tomorrow. How do you know? The fact that it is part of the income of the managers, I think it's something that motivates them to reach that goal. It's not in the long run as well. It's not something that you just do over a month. It lasts over a period of maybe three years. It's not just one discussion. We have uh, many, many exchanges and discussions with them. We check. Uh, that the intentions are real, etc. So one questionnaire per customer. Do you have customers or clients who do not respond? Yes, there are companies who do not respond. We want names. No, I cannot give you names, unfortunately. But indeed, all the companies, not all the companies have responded to the questionnaire yet. Either it didn't reach the right person or they don't have too much to say. We don't know. Any other good practice? What are companies doing well? Now, regarding plastic, there are several things like uh, suppressing plastic. Caring, for example, has a goal to suppress all plastic, unique use plastic. So that's positive. It could be recyclability. Just Coca Cola, for example, 98% of their what they produce is recyclable. So it's not far from their 100% objective. And then everything else that's recyclable, Michelin, for example, between 25 to 30% in their products and their tires of, of recycled plastic, recycled materials. That's very practical indeed. OK, let's move on to Christian now. I know you know each other very well. Christian from Swain Blue Ocean. Could you introduce yourself? And then we'll talk. Can I ask her a question? That's the first step, really. Transparency and concrete goals. Um, now, have you, OK, you have those who do not respond, those who do not reach their goals. From your, uh, com from your point of view as an insurance company, are there any measures or sanctions or, or some um, releases or or some sanctions maybe even for not reaching that goal or what is the impact? Yes, we uh, make an assessment and an assessment at the end of the three years to put forward the best practices. This is the first thing that we do. And then and that's the extreme limit, on the other hand, if you like. We can also exclude, actually, a company if we consider that they did not reach their goal or did not, they were not honest or they were not um, having good practices. So that's really the last resort. Once you exclude a company, you are no longer an investor, you are no longer, no longer legitimate, and it's like giving up, and I'm not sure this is the right strategy either. You have to find the right balance, and we are really seeking to find the best practices. Okay, large groups are really uh, reaching those goals. Is this really a good thing? Is this really significant to reduce plastic, for example? Yes, regarding plastic, I uh, don't know so much about this. Uh, we don't deal with plastic so much at Action and Ocean and Climate, but indeed, the private sector is launching a lot of initiatives. The IPCC report talks about that. Just a few months ago in their report, they talk about it. Uh, we can see it scientifically um, speaking. We can see a start, a beginning of a reduction of plastic. 
we can see that there is movement, that there are companies that are being decarbonized and that there are, they are making headways in practices in the economic sector. Is this recent? Is this change recent? Are we talking about three, four years or 10 years? To be honest, I'm not quite sure. I would say that this is sufficiently important to be noted. So your questionnaire, Sabine, is quite recent, isn't it? So it's only been a few years that people have been concerned about the ocean, yes. Fossil energy, carbon, etc., is a bit older. Uh, this round table is a sign of what's happening. This is a topic that is really rising, just as biodiversity. It's something that is more recent indeed in order to implement all the various tools and indicators to take into account this issue. Okay, and now we have Christian Lim just coming along. So Christian, you are from Swan Blue Ocean. Could you give us a description of what is Swan Blue Ocean? Tell us about it. Okay, Swen is a liabilities uh, manager investing in funds and also managing funds. We have about 7 billion euros. And it was founded about 10 years ago with a focus on the ESG uh, with a greater impact. And we were pioneer in this field. And within Swen, I co-manage a fund called Blue Ocean, which is a venturing capital Watch out for your big words here. Yeah, I'm going to translate those words. Meaning that we are investing in startups and young companies which are developing innovations for the regeneration of the ocean. So we have a fund of about 100 million euros, a bit more. We continue to expand. And we started about last year, last September during the World Congress for Conservation in Marseille. We started this fund uh, with Yves Mer, which is the institute for the research institute, French research institute on the ocean, with uh, the support of committed investors like Massif. And we have invested in this company to bring solutions in, in three main areas uh, representing the three main threats, overfishing. One is overfishing, for example, we are investing in some aquaculture solutions to reduce the pressure of aquaculture, which is a source of pollution. Aquaculture is an alternative to fishing, but we have to resolve the issues regarding aquaculture. Secondly, we have also invested in some solutions f to fight against plastic pollution in order to to, to teach people how to use their toothpaste or their soap in a reusable uh, packaging. And we are bringing solutions to climate change with oceans, for example, we invested in a company called BlueNav to electrify ships with a hybrid approach, something that can happen quickly and not in 20 years' time from now. So do you decide, are you the one making the decision, do you decide which projects you want to invest in? You have a scientific expertise. And you can identify those projects. Yeah, the expertise has to be multiple. We need to have investors. Our goal, actually, I should have said, is to have a systemic impact. I'm glad you use that word. What's behind what we're saying is that we are talking about systemic challenges. We have to find systemic answers. So it's an important topic. We need to talk about that some more. And then we have some uh, re market return, competitive market. We are a fund, an investment fund, not very large. Yet we believe this is an approach that should uh, become more common now. 
So we have to be very profitable in order to attract more capitals, more funds, where we need um, expertise as a an organization. We have uh, investors' expertise in our team. We have some really well-seasoned experts. We have a, an ocean expertise that we have developed. And we everything that you mentioned, we really experience this every day. And every day we ask ourselves, is the company going to have an impact on the ocean? And of course, this is a complex question. Yet, we cannot answer this question by ourselves. We have to call for teams. We have dedicated teams. It's not that common. Uh, investment companies don't always have a dedicated team. We are fortunate to have this resource. We also have advisors. We have uh, counselors who are helping us, high-level advisors. For example, Laurent Auguste, who was a former executive director of Adveolia, is helping us on circular economy. We also have ocean experts with dedicated uh, teams. Brad Act, for example, former vice president in the US in charge of the oceans, also part of this committee. And he shares his views on our investments, on the impact of our investments. And then we are we have a whole ecosystem. So we do have a lot of resources and we need those resources to really answer this simple question, will this society have a systemic impact? Will it produce return on investment as an investor, as a financer? Is it something kind of new to take into account the environment and the ocean in particular? Is this a new approach to the way you work to, to take into account a variable? Actually, we have been doing this for the last four years since we launched this strategy. With the help of MASIP, we were able to scale up. We conceived our project in that way. It's not something new as such. It's really at the heart of our project. However, taken into account, actually not so much taking into account, it's not an add-on, if you like. Uh, it's something that really is at the heart of our investment. That's something new in the, fi in the financial field building a strategy in order to have a positive impact on the ocean. The first driver is what it will uh, bring back, what it will, um, what, will it, what it will yield if you do not have a profitable project, you will not go for it. Well, okay, if a project is, does not have a positive impact and systemic impact on the ocean. We don't actually go for it. Our goal are, is, is twofold, if you like. One depends on the other. In our approach, in order to have an impact, the positive impact, we have to realize that. We talked about um, stakes, challenges, we did not give any numbers, but according to some studies, we're going to lose 90% of the coral species by 2030. So these are the kind of challenges that we are facing. We don't have enough time. We have to find large-scale solutions for the, in the next five to 10 years. So having an impact does not necessarily m mean having a, a positive local impact, but we're talking about large-scale impact, positive impact. And if, for that to happen in our strategy, what drives this is profitability. And this is what will um, help these solutions to be fueled by the finances in order to have a growth such as Google or Facebook, so the two are really connected and linked. Could we maybe just give, could you give us one example or one investment, a remarkable one? Could you tell us a bit more about that one? That was our first investment, which this is a company, a company, Optoscale, which is from Norway, from Trondheim, in the middle of Norway which is really at the heart of a uh, salmon raising. They have developed uh, submarine cameras uh, with the help of computers, and they can observe summons 
in the uh, salmon farms underwater in huge cages. You can imagine these are huge cages, 30, 40 meters diameter, about 200,000 salmon. So the cameras watches the salmon and can tell you the weight of the salmon in real time. And that did not exist before. No, this is something new, maybe the last two years. It's something that is very recent. What is the purpose of weighing uh, salmon? Aquaculture, as I said, could be a solution for overfishing. Instead of fishing fish in the ocean, you can breed the fish in fishing farms. However, aquaculture and also aquaculture is already replacing fishing. Probably for the last 10 or 15 years, we've seen that the great majority of the fish that we eat comes from aquaculture. So this is a positive aspect, except that aquaculture as such is a threat for the ocean. Two main threats. First is solution because of the excess of food and also the compo components of the food for fish. I don't know if you know this salmon are fed with wild fish, which contributes to overfishing. So this is not so much of a solution in the end, but we have to control the food in order to reduce the production of uh, wild fish and uh, the ocean. So, so this company, in order to control the food, we need to know the weight of the summons. Otherwise, we don't know how much food they need to take in. So this new scheme allows them to do this. Normally, it takes about a year and a half to two years for a summon to grow to the adult size. So you cannot take out all the summons like you would do for cows and goats to weigh them individually. And it was not possible until that until that new uh, system. Is the ocean happy when people stop overfishing it? What do the ocean think? The ocean thinks it should happen quicker. 34% of the fish are overfished. It's still a large number. We also have examples of success stories of some fish uh, species through some rules and regulations, through more sustainable uh, fishing rules. We have stock of species coming back. Um, the ocean is very resilient. I'm sure you've all seen this. Uh, pictures and documentaries of dolphins who were going back to the Mediterranean Sea. When we stop putting pressure on the ecosystems, uh, most of them really manage to come back to a good ecological state and very quickly so. So yes, overfishing is a question indeed. We need to put everyone in agreement on the international scene. We don't have the same needs. In terms of fishing, some fish are migrating because of the global warming to go to cooler seas in the northern hemisphere. So we have more and more models like that, which enable us to change the approach to fishing. But it's a, a whole sector that needs to be reinvented from practice to equipment, to the vision, to the resource of fishing. It's important. We feed. Um, we feed fish with fish feed, that wild fish feed, then that sounds astonishing. Uh, so we need to focus on that. Jérôme Bellin, thank you for being here. You are the co-founder of Removal Carbon. So let's now do a quick segue. So between you and Christian, you are um, working with companies and project managers, right? Could you please explain? Jérôme, yes, our role is to provide advice to project developers. So we are, um, in a way, a co-developer of project. And our role is to uh, bring funding to those project developers. So to raise funds, we will work with uh, companies, uh, funders that are committed on climate issues and sometimes on blue finance so that uh, this funding can be used to for um, preservation uh, projects. Uh, moderator, why are those companies interested in such projects? What is uh, 
the logic behind Jérôme. So, uh, we focus on carbon, but there are two ways you can support climate uh, projects. So, because there are many benefits in doing so. There can be a lot of impacts in terms of biodiversity for local people. Oceans are, is, are the main resource of um, coastal areas. Um, people living in coastal areas live off uh, oceans. So these areas are rich in term, and oceans are rich in terms of impact. And as you said, impact is at the core of their approach. Should we watch a short uh, presentation? I'm sorry, I'm the only one with a slight presentation. I thought that we were supposed to have one. No, that's a good thing, says the moderator. So our driver is carbon finance. As I said, we are a co-developer and an investor in Carbon Project. I'm sorry, you all had to uh, change seats. So we work on what we call voluntary carbon market. It, it's a bit, uh, it's written very small, but I will explain. So in a few words, the voluntary carbon market is uh, stands out from regulatory carbon markets. There are many throughout the world with the cap and tread uh, system or uh, the carbon tax. So regulatory markets put in place by governments. We take part in the voluntary carbon market. It deals with companies, local authorities, public or private actors who wish to commit um, in working for the climate. Those projects are certified by international standards. The most well known is the Clean Development Mechanism from the UN. It was put in place as part of the Kyoto Protocol over 15 years ago. And then there are other international standards like VCF, Verified Carbon Standard, and the Gold Standard. So these projects will be certified by the certification bodies. Then they will be audited by independent uh, auditors, accredi accredited, accredited by those um, bodies. And these different stakeholders uh, will fund their projects uh, by acquiring uh, carbon credits that are certified, moderator. So everything is uh, quite uh, very clear. There is this, a sort of a regulatory circle created, right? Jérôme, this is a voluntary carbon market, but uh, there are uh, best practices that are more and more regulated, and people who want to be serious in their approach uh, will uh, carry out those projects certified by uh, the most well-known international standards. ICROA is the international association defining uh, best practices on this market and is taking action along those lines. And in France, um, there is the law of climate uh, called climate and resilience, and it states what companies can claim in terms of carbon neutrality, how, what type of project they can um, carry out. So those projects cannot be used to communicate uh, on their uh, commitment when it comes to climate neutrality. Uh, moderator, uh, can you give us name? Yeah, Jérôme, yes, you've asked for some names. So here we have a few examples. So let's start the list. We have about half an hour ahead of us. No, I will tell you about two different commitments, carbon neutrality and net zero, the net zero goal. So a company defines a horizon 2050 and most of the time between 2030 and 2040 and the objective is to reduce massively their carbon emission and um, sequester as much carbon as possible. So those are the types of commitments made by those companies. And these companies you can see on screen are committed. You can see um, companies like Kerim with a net zero goal, Michelin, and I'm thinking of uh, the post office 
uh, in France as well because they are one of the most committed uh, player in this field. This market is quite dynamic. It was created about 15 years ago. It is uh, now booming and as you can see on the screen and on this graph, you can see the volumes of carbon credits used by companies who wish to contribute by funding such projects. And what we can see is that um, in 2021, 160 million tons equivalent CO2 uh, were um, used by uh, and fu funded by companies. So it doesn't seem like much, but it's um, a way forward. There are different players, social actors, social players uh, present in southern countries. And what we can see here, 35% to 40% of projects are nature-based solutions, not all dealing with uh, renewables uh, or fuel switch. And there are also projects working on environment preservation. And there are also blue carbon um, projects. So let me tell you about the size of this market. As we said, this is a small scale um, market, with, uh, but it has um, quite interesting projections. The market is es estimated at $1 billion, so that's quite good to fund such projects. But we estimate that by 2050, it should um, account for $100 billion. Uh, so this there will be um, funding opportunities i can see that um christian is putting on his glasses so he seems interested so that's great the uh, moderator there was a mic on the floor Jérôme, so this market is evolving, is increasing because uh, carbon, the carbon price is also increasing. What's interesting now is that the price of carbon credit is increasing, so um, the revenues are also more interesting, which helps us create additional projects to preserve oceans, for that matter. So to reach net, the net zero goal, even though the market is developing, the gap between existing projects and the projects will need to meet our demand by 2050 is huge. So we need to develop as many projects as we can to generate 50 times more um, carbon projects. So how many projects are certified right now, Jérôme? So the projects are uh, go through a crediting period and it lasts between the it lasts for um, 20 years and can moderator can you renew this period for the same project Jérôme yes you have to go through the accreditation uh, process again you have to rework on the baseline of this project so it's quite complex from a methodological point of view but right from the start there are about 6,000 projects that have been funded throughout the world so that's quite good but we need to do much more now, if we look at blue carbon, what is it? Blue carbon is uh, the carbon that is stored in uh, marine and coastal um, ecosystems. So all the areas that are defined as um, ecosystem storing carbon, the Intergovernmental uh, Ocean Commission of the UNESCO also states that those um, ecosystems uh, are important because they store a lot of carbon. And now if we focus on mangroves, They account for 15.2 million hectares uh, throughout the world. These um, ecosystems are under threat because they're under a lot of uh, pressure from uh, de the deterioration of the environment because of um, plastic pollution as well. 
because it prevents uh, mangroves from uh, developing, breathing. So it harms um, the ability of those mangroves to um, store carbon. So there is a um, huge deterioration of um, those ecosystems. And as I said, the potential uh, for carbon storage is um, huge. It stores um, three to five times more carbon than forests. Moderator. So are there any projects working on mangroves specifically? So what can we do? Do you have um, an a precise uh, example? Jérôme, there are two types of projects, preservation projects. First and foremost, to preserve a deteriorated uh, mangrove, putting in place different types of uh, practices in natural parks, for instance, to help the mangrove regenerate. And then there are also restoration projects. So you plant new mangroves. It's quite complex because you have to find the right species. It has to be fit for uh, purpose. And uh, because, of course, um, we have to take into account the biodiversity in the area. We need to find the right species. We need to find uh, the right professional able to plant mangroves because we need to plant them. But this project also needs to be long term. Christian, may I add something regarding uh, mangrove projects? We looked at mangroves from a different angle. We looked at the root causes of mangrove deterioration, and that is um, uh, shrimp breeding. Shrimps are bred in uh, basins, and breeding them uh, releases pollutants antibiotics or um, food uh, excess, food surplus, which will um, leak into mangroves. So we have worked with Nore. It's a Norwegian and Spanish company. It produces shrimps um, on land in a closed circle with a highly positive carbon footprint. It doesn't pollute uh, mangroves. Shrimps uh, do not come from uh, the other side of the world because they are produced locally. And what's even more important from an economic point of view, the company is now able to um, have a competitive price compared to other shrimps uh, produced um, usually on the market. So they are competitive from a pricing point of view and they are much more environmentally friendly. So that's a great example, says Jérôme. So our project is quite important because we replant mangroves, but then it also helps local population. Sustainable aquaculture is a type of uh, project that we can implement. Your example of shrimps is great. Uh, there are also uh, other projects uh, working on crab breeding as well. And then it can protect from um, erosion, right, says Sabine. Jérôme, yes, uh, mangroves um, have uh, three billion of uh, fish species living inside them. So what we do, is, what we do with mangroves is fighting against erosion as well, is um, helping fight against um, um, other things. So it is great in terms of uh, adaptation to climate change. And lastly, we need our investors for another reason. The number of projects that are certified as part of this certification for carbon are quite limited. We have six projects. We have a huge demand. All the companies in connection with the oceans, maritime transport or other stakeholders in connection with oceans who want to have a positive impact in terms of bio biodiversity want to support this project. We do not have enough projects. We have six projects. How many more waiting? Uh, we have about 10 projects waiting for certification that have been listed being under develop as being under development, and there are many more projects 
uh, behind. Uh, we are working on 12 projects under development with NGOs, with associations, social businesses in countries. I've just given you a few examples and a few, uh, to a, a few uh, city countries like Togo, Asia, in Birmania, in Bangladesh, uh, Central and S uh, Latin America as well. Anything in France? Good question. In France, there is a under uh, uh, there's a methodology on the way, which is a certification scheme that is steered by the Ministry of Ecology as part of this lab label. There is a methodology that is underway, um, um, waiting for its certification. So in a few months' time, we will be able to certify a, a number of projects, uh, low carbon projects, and to issue some income as well. So it will be possible, especially overseas, uh, where there are mangroves in Guadeloupe, in Martinique, for example. Jérôme, you were talking about the carbon credit, a compensation offset for carbon. And what about you, Jérôme? What do you do? Our role is, is really the DNA of uh, our company is really to support projects, to develop projects and to invest in the certification process, which is very costly and very long, and to support uh, these companies to get finances, to get funds for the project. With our team, we have some funds uh, dedicated to projects, but then we help those projects to scale up. Next is what do we do regarding the company? We are a young company. We are preparing our first carbon uh, assessment uh, and uh, in in line with our activities and we will be supporting companies that will be identified by our collaborators what you need to know is there are under there are projects under development but the certification takes a long time usually it takes about 2 to 3 years to get carbon credits these are the kind of pro projects which are very popular for um, populations. So we might support these kind of projects. What about you? Do you go to places? Do you visit those projects on site? Yes. When you invest on projects on the ground, you have to go and select the right projects to make sure that these projects are sustainable. So we do go to places. We go to visit the sites. We went to Senegal a few weeks ago for another kind of project uh, f in the Casamance region for improving the cooking equipment. Uh, part of the mangrove issues is to cut uh, the woods uh, for cooking purposes. So we visited a project, a uh, carbon project uh, in Senegal. Now the question is, what do we do to reduce our carbon print? We try to limit, I guess you don't go by ship there. Unfortunately not, yes. Yes, indeed, in order to visit a site in Senegal, I think it would probably take about a week to get there. En train de mettre en place une politique voyage actuellement avec les collaborateurs. We are trying to reduce our carbon print. Our goal here is, and our priority, is absolutely to reduce our carbon print at all costs. We are trying to reduce our travels, but we do have to go to places sometimes. And we will try to offset what we cannot do. Uh, we will also do a um, carbon print saving with our collaborators, not just with a company. Okay, it's good to show the example. Okay, let's move back in the middle. Do you have questions? Uh, I'm going to give you the mic, hand over the mic to you, and we'll have a time of Q&A. You have the floor. Please ask, tell us your name and just ask your question. Hello, I'm Dominique. <laughs> Thank you for all the solutions which you are offering. I do have a question. For Jérôme, I've been working with, I, I work with West Africa. What is your project in Togo, especially? And asking a question for the four of you. 
you mentioned a lot of virtuous solutions. What is the main enemy? What is a common enemy? What are you fighting against in order to move forwards in your actions? Jérôme, would you like to start? So in Togo, we have several projects underway, two, one for cooking and one for restoring mangroves. The two, again, are connected because of the pressure on the mangroves, uh, either for the for building building houses or for cooking. So we are working with a local partner, TMSU. We are restoring mangroves in Togo. Togo is not we the country with the largest uh, area of mangroves. There are other countries with larger areas of mangroves, yet it's it's on the coastal area there is still a pressure because of urban development construction heating etc so this is a project of restore for to restore the mangroves now regarding uh, our challenges i would say that our main challenge is twofold carbon finance is something that is not very well known so our role, therefore, in order to get fundings is to go and explain to investors like Massif and others how it all works, to tell them and show to them that this is something that has become mature, that is robust. And we are talking to companies who are interested in financing such projects, and not to get into details, the first challenge is really to raise, raise awareness, to explain how things work, and to show that this is possible. We have many examples of many success stories uh, over the last 15 years. So the other challenge from the corporate side and corporate's commitment, the companies that are buying into this carbon project is to find the right balance between the will to find the, the to invest and not to go too far or take it too far we've seen some abuse with uh, carbon offsetting with some pushy uh, measures which could have a counterproductive effect people might say that this is some kind of greenwashing uh, yet there are great projects with great certifications and great audit with external experts. So these are great projects that have huge benefits for the populations and the ecosystems. So we should not take it too far into the communication. Otherwise, it might just discredit the project. Uh, Sabine, what are the enemies? What are the levers? or the drivers, I would say, to pessimism. You have to remain optimistic to keep on going. That would be the first enemy to fight. And rules and regulations, uh, also there is pros and cons. It could be better. We could be better encouraged as investors. We have a lot of rules and regulations to respect when it comes to blue finance, green finance, etc. And that's not the case. I think this is a lack. And yet we have an avalanche of of uh, of um, inventory. So we should not be spending too much time writing reports rather than actually doing the work and financing projects. This is f so less administrative work and more uh, hands-on work. Yeah, and maybe a r rules that would be more favorable for blue and green projects. Are you talking about politics here? Yes, indeed. Another question maybe from the floor? Thank you, Kinome. I had a question for people investing in projects or in companies. We talked quickly about the mangroves. We talked about the populations living there. And I wanted to know, beside the environmental impact, which of course is a priority, 
what about the societal impact of those projects and the consequences on the conservation projects and the projects we will change the way we will be using the oceans, the way we will be fishing on fishing communities, coastal communities, and all the population that will be affected by a change of practices. Is it something that has been assessed, that has been valued, that has been analyzed, or is this a sort of a forgotten angle? Who would like to answer this? Christian? I think Jérôme probably could say a few words about this. You were talking about shrimps, salmons. Yes, I was talking about the systemic impact earlier on that could be defined in different ways. You cannot have a systemic impact, positive systemic impact on the environment and yet have a negative uh, a, ne a negative impact on communities. So when we're talking about a systemic impact, we're talking about a 360 degrees vision, which is why we have developed. And when I say we, I'm talking about us, Swen and the um, Blue Ocean Fund, but also the world ecosystems of incubators and accelerators and a coalition, 1,000 ocean startup. So we have developed a methodology to measure the impact for all those who are investing in innovations to regenerate the oceans. This was launched at the UN last June during the uh, conference in Lisbon. And this is something which we hope will be adopted at large. And of course, there will be a societal uh, aspect to it. This is, so do you go and meet the populations? on site, those that will be impacted one way or another by the change of practices. Maybe, Jérôme, you could say a few words about that. Do you meet them? Do you talk to them? Do you see them? Just to answer this question, often we talk about carbon projects. Car carbon finance is a way to generate incomes for uh, to uh, fund projects beside the eco benefits of course the population is at the heart of the project populations are at the forefront in the case of the mangrove they are the one who will be restoring the ecosystem they will be involved in all the actions around the project so if we are not able to involve the local communities then the projects will not be successful. They are really at the heart of our project. They are really there to carry out all the action. They will evolve in their practices, which is why I was talking earlier on about the various activities generating uh, income as well. Populations have to find ways to get some more income, for example, for the mangroves, which are being cut for building. These are people who are going to cut the woods to sell it to carpenters. So these people would have to find other types of activities. So the purpose here is really to build the project with them and to find, to find other options so that the pressure against the mangroves will stop. Okay, I'm changing the question slightly. Do you, does your platform take into account the populations in the coastal areas? Yes, of course. First of all, we are hosting a number of solutions. We have about 100 members. We have quite a large number of French people. We have people in Papua New Guinea, in the Philippines, South America, etc. We have projects pretty much everywhere. So our approach when we talk about climate, biodiversity, and ocean is to make connection between science, politics, and the ocean, and to connect biodiversity and the ocean. It's not always easy. It's a vast task. But we want to have a systemic approach and to take into account all of these parameters when we talk about sustainable development, the societal aspect is absolutely pivotal. We have environmental issues, but the societal aspect is at the heart of it all a project that will restore an ecosystem but would deprive a population of uh, access to some of their activities or historical activities, it would not work. More globally speaking, 
besides what we are doing with our platform, is something that is also of an interest to scientists. Uh, today, we have a lot of um, people uh, who are asking for local indigenous knowledge uh, to be taken into account, to be totally included in the process, in the reports when we are doing scientific uh, creation. So we are trying to come out of the academics. We need the academic science, of course, but we also want to be um, inspired by local practices from the local populations who know how to maintain ecosystems and have been doing so for hundreds of years, if not thousands. So there's a lot of challenges. We want to open up to new knowledge to stop looking at it as something rigid and a bit dusty and to mix what the social sciences are saying and mix it with what the local populations and communities in order to reach the uh, sustainable and resilient um, development. We have three, we have 10 more minutes and three questions, I believe. Okay, hello, I'm Gail. Just a question regarding the carbon credit for companies. You mentioned some audits. Imagine you are financing a project for restoring a mangroves and the mangrove is destroyed, for example, a few years later on. Do we take back the carbon credits from the company? What happens then? Thanks for your question. Actually, we do not give the carbon credits company. They buy these credits, which is how we generate revenues, incomes, in order to finance projects. Um, I'm going to go into more technical details now. When you certify a project, a forest project, for example, a, mangro a mangrove project is actually a, a forest project. In the methodology, we have a buffer pool. For example, if a restoration mangrove project is going to go over time, the credit will be exposed and not ex ante. So we will calculate the carbon that has been sequestrated during the past years. It's not a future projection uh, for what will happen in the future. These are reductions which were noted before. So then we will look at the carbon, whether it will be sequestered in the long run or not. So we have what we call buffer pools. So if a project, for example, enables a sequestration of 100 tons of carbon, so as part of this methodology, you will have about a buffer, about 10 to 20 percent. Again, it depends on projects and methodologies. But every year, if you could have about 100 carbon credits, you will take out a buffer of 20 percent to prevent um, from future hazards, uh, could be climate hazards or all kind of other hazards, etc. So this buffer system. Uh, enables us to guarantee the sustainability of their system. Another question? Okay. Oui, bonjour à tous. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sarah. I work in fi sustainable financing. And to which extent do you think blue financing will allow us to change things up a little bit? especially when it comes to more traditional fishing industry. We all think about that uh, sea spiracy documentary that came out on Netflix uh, that uh, was very eye-opening it, when it comes to the role of different actors in fishing and the oceans. So to what extent, I, I, I don't know if this is something that concerns you directly, but to what extent do you think it is a priority so that we can improve things in this domain? And how can blue financing contribute to this? Who wants to go for it for this? One of the three pillars of our is to find uh, solutions for overfishing or to combat overfishing. We have two years to do this. We have two points of leverage. We want to support technology to make fishing more sustainable. If I take the example that was given for Nore, we have uh, prawns 
uh, that are farmed are in mangroves, thus taking away from shrimp or prawn fishing, because we know that prawn fishing is very um, difficult, it's very non-sustainable, because for bycatch we've got for one kilo of prawn, you've got uh, six to ten kilos of other species that are then thrown back into the sea and killed for nothing. Therefore, if we're able to find an alternative that is competitive uh, to this, it's, it's part of the solution. We also have more direct solutions. So this is a third facet. We're looking at substitution. We also have uh, a more selective system with lights that allow us to um, dissuade some um, shoals of fish and or schools of fish and attract others. We have selective systems as well with submarine uh, cameras so that we can see what you're fishing because often fishers don't see what they're fishing. We also have different systems in place allowing that we, we've been looking at these types of solutions for the longest time now and we haven't yet invested in them but we're following them very closely and that there could be these types of solutions out there. And the third facet now because I said that there were three uh, substitutes Institution, technology and sustainable techniques and the third is data what is the data we could uh, how can we better know what the fishing stocks are but what else what about data that allows us to make uh, actors in the sector accountable we have nature matrix which is a British company that rolls out in eDNA, which is environmental DNA, looking at the eDNA in the water. And technology is very complicated. It's not that costly. I would say a couple of hundred euros for a sample for the detect all of the life from bacteria uh, to whales. And this could actually be quite useful for carbon certification as well. And if we think about all the competitors that are out there, what else has been done, the different measures for biodiversity. Uh, we've got scientists who are going to count how many fish uh, are out there. This is something that comes in to complete the methodology. We have invested in order to democratize biodiversity. And this can seem like I'm throwing out words out there, but it's transparent. And then it's also accountability. This is at the heart of uh, problems. Uh, uh, not just linked to sea spiracy, but others, because the ocean is it's cowboy land, it's the far west. But if there is uh, accountability, then we can really start changing the state of play and this in a profound manner. Does that answer your question? The speaker is not using a microphone. What are the different means of pressure that we can use to exert pressure? So, for example, a traditional act is, um, is blue finance, uh, if we've got direct finance. How can we exert pressure? Uh, I don't know what regulations are out there. What are the different means to shake things up a bit for the sector as it currently exists? Because obviously your contribution is beneficial for lots of different projects and investments in technology and disruptive technologies. But whilst waiting, I think that we need to look at the dynamic. There are lots of innovation as one of the points of leverage. But this can be for investment. Uh, this is what Sabine mentioned. And then we've got MS the Mary Stewardship Council, who obviously look at uh, sustainable fishing. These are the different vectors that can be used to exert uh, pressure. It's fundamental. And for there to be a positive response, we need there to be awareness raising and technological solutions as well.
you also need the other facet. Therefore, this is something that is maybe the two sides of the same coin, and this is why you have to work together so that there is real transformation. Sabine, so what about Massifa? Yes, as a guarantor, we also work with businesses. We need to vote on this, and I think that this is a point of leverage that is important for some businesses that have uh, behaviors that are maybe less than um, great. Any other questions? Yes? OK, here we go. Good morning, Etienne. I had a question for Anaïs, so thank you very much for having taken the floor. It's about the role played by the platform Océan et Climat. What are the different types of interventions? Who do you work with? Uh, what do you do with recommendations? Do you admit recommendations? And what do people do with them? Did you work with the UN? Uh, I just wanted to know a little bit more about what you do and also what, what types of actors you work with. Thank you very much for the question. I didn't really go into details, you're right, um, but in a nutshell, uh, the platform is a multi-actor network with about 100 or so associations, a lot of NGOs, a lot of scientists. We have a coalition, it's a spontaneous coalition, and this came to play just before the COP21 when they had access to the preamble of the, uh, called the, the Paris Agreement, and they realized that the ocean wasn't even mentioned. This happens at home in Paris. We are going to look at dealing with this issue and then we have uh, the states who are signatories of the Paris Agreement that need to take this into consideration in their, in their mitigation and adaptation. We have different economic actors, we work with aquarium scientists uh, and other actors that were mentioned today. But Thanks to um, France's support, we were able to include the ocean. But the, no one spoke about the ocean with climate change, but it was important to do so. And therefore, there was a real association between the two. With more uh, support, we work hand in hand with the United Nations, specifically with the framework of agreement, uh, UNFCCC, the United Nations Framework Agreement on uh, Climate Change. We also want to look at oceans and climate change and negotiations on biodiversity. All of the multilateral aspects, we need to understand the interconnectivity between this. And we also think about the systemic approach in order to develop policies that are going to be sustainable. And thanks to the expertise of our members, we're able to develop lots of different recommendations, policies for France and others, and also for the United Nations. And we're able to develop, uh, for example, the IPCC report is something that we use to mobilize our members. And and this for public decision makers. And we need to maybe explain this in layman terms. Last question, and then we wrap things up. I think that it was great timing for me because what you said, um, there are convergences. Uh, I'm delighted to hear what you're saying, and I'm delighted to hear that the ocean is on the agenda. I believe that when we think about ocean, we also need to think about health because we speak a lot about um, ownership and I would have even wanted to say, why not, spoke up, why not speak about rather oceans and energy? This is also part of the discussions. I uh, try to promote health because health and climate is important. For me, this is, uh, you can't speak about one without speaking about the other. We've mentioned this on several occasions, but ocean and health, ocean and health within energy. Yes, absolutely, these are parts of the subjects that we look at. There are so many of them that I didn't have time to give a list. I think that everyone would probably fall asleep if I went through all of the different and things that we work on. But yes, it goes without saying everything is interlinked. Um, okay, fall asleep. I don't think that no one's going to fall asleep, but thank you to all of the four uh, speakers. I thought it was extremely concrete. Thank you very much. And thank you to you guys as well for your questions. It was very interesting. And thank you and have a wonderful rest of the day.